All right, so this week we're going to talk about my favorite subject, your favorite subject, everybody's favorite subject, money. Uh, I had a student a few semesters ago who, no matter what question I asked to this point in the semester, his answer was always money. He was highly upset that it took us so long to get to his favorite topic. So here we go, let's talk about money. In order to talk about money, we need to understand what money is. The economic definition of money is the poorest definition I've ever seen. Money is anything that performs the functions of money. Okay, that doesn't tell me anything. So what we need to do is we need to understand what the functions of money are. There are three functions. First is that anything you choose to use as money must act as a medium of exchange. What that means is it makes exchange easier. It makes buying things easier. Think about what would happen if we didn't have money. We would have to barter. We would have to exchange goods for goods. Now that's fine if I have a <clears throat> pair of motorcycle tires and you have a laptop. You want the motorcycle tires. I want the laptop. We can just swap them. That is barter. But what happens if I have motorcycle tires, I want a laptop, but you want a Keurig, a coffee maker. Well, <clears throat> I've got to take my motorcycle tires, find somebody who has a Keurig who wants the motorcycle tires. So they'll swap with me and then I can go back and swap with you for the laptop. Now, can you see how this can become cumbersome, how this can become unwielding? Uh, making all of those little connections so that I can trade what you, for what you want. The other thing happens is money is necessary because think about a farmer who only gets crop once a year, only gets it, you know, gets their, what they can trade once a year. How do they live the rest of the year? What do they barter? All right. So money becomes this third commodity that everyone is willing to accept. Now, money also has some other really great properties. And let's look at that. The second function of money is as a standard of value. And by a standard of value, we mean it's something that allows us to compare the prices of goods. For example, if you have apples and I have oranges, how many apples should I swap with you to get how many oranges? So if we know an apple is 25 cents, we know an orange is 50 cents, I need to exchange two apples for one orange. All right. Um, this is more of an issue um, when we're talking about items that we may not really know much about. All right. I don't know what it costs to make a computer. I don't know what goes into that. But, you know, how do I judge the value of a computer if I'm not very, much, very aware of it? So money helps us be that standard of value helps us compare the value of goods. The final function of money is extremely important. It is a store of value. It holds value over time. Now we saw in our lecture of inflation, what happens when money doesn't hold its value, right? But think about this. Let's go back to that example of the farmer. A farmer gets their crop, say it's a, a corn farmer. Farmer only gets a crop once a year. 
they don't want to keep their crop for a year. You know, is it going to go bad? Is it going to get moldy? Whatever. They want to be able to sell their crop, but they want to hold the value of that crop. They don't may not want to, they don't want to spend all your money right after you get your, your harvest because you know you need to live off that money the rest of the year. So you need something that's going to hold the value of your crop for time. And that's where money comes in. If you look around the room that you're in right now, virtually everything in your sight can be used for money. Now, some things are more practical uh, to use for money, like a pen or a pencil. Um, I don't know that your couch would be a good thing of money because it's kind of hard to move around, but you know, anything can be used for money. Be careful about those things, though, if you've got a donut sitting next to you. Uh, I don't think a donut's going to hold value over time. It's going to get stale. It's going to get moldy. So you, you, you need to look at things like that. Now, over time, we have used a lot of different things for money. Cattle, alcohol, tobacco, cowrie shells. All sorts of things have been used for money. Um, <clears throat> there's a great article that was written right after the Second World War by a gentleman who had been an American, um, an American soldier who had been a prisoner of a German in a German POW camp, and a great article on how they use cigarettes as money, and he explained how there was inflation when the Red Cross packages that contained cigarettes came into the camp, right? There was a quick infusion of money. Uh, and then how towards the end of the war, when the Red Cross packages were not being brought into uh, the camps, how money dried up, men had smoked their cigarettes, cigarettes had gotten damaged, all these other things. So uh, interesting article. If you're interested in it, um, email me and I'll be glad to give you the citation. Very interesting um, article on money. But when we look at money over time, we needed to have something that performed these three functions, but was also durable. So let's take a look at some of those things that can be used for money. Some of the first things that we have documentation of that was used for money were coins. Now I have a picture here of a Lydian coin. Um, it's the first known or the earliest known coinage uh, in the West. Uh, forgive me, there's, I don't have necessarily all of the information of coinage in the East, so there may very well have been uh, coins in the East much earlier, but we found these Lydian coins. Now, these coins had value because of what they were made of. They were made of precious metals, gold, silver, copper. Whatever the metal was that was precious in your area, that's what you made your coins out of. Now, the first bankers, uh, if we can call them that, were money changers. They knew what a coin was made of in one country and what the coins were made of in the other country, and they knew the difference in the metals. and So they didn't bother counting out coins. They just weighed them. They knew the weight, the standard weight of gold. They knew the standard weight of silver. They knew how they were supposed to relate it to each other. So coins were great because you knew the value of them based on the metal that they were made of. Now, there's a problem with coins. Have you ever tried to carry around a pocket full of a lot of change? Right. Very cumbersome. It's heavy. It's bulky. Um, and think of that jar of um, pennies or coins that you have at home. I think all of us have a, a change jar 
where we throw our extra change in because we don't want to carry it around. Um, think how heavy that gets. And if you had a lot of wealth and your wealth was in coinage, ah, that becomes difficult. Uh, so we had to figure out another way of moving our money. Now, the earliest paper money that we can find, uh, we have to go back to the Tang Dynasty of the 7th century uh, in China. Uh, we do believe paper money was used before this. We just don't have documentation of that uh, since the Chinese uh, really were the ones that... Uh, I don't want to say invented paper, but first used paper. Um, we can see that obviously that would make sense that they would come up with paper money. Now, the way the paper money worked was that it was basically deposit receipts. Uh, merchants had a certain amount of money, a certain amount of, say, let's gold, say gold coins. They had... Um, left it um, in their vaults at home um, and they wanted to go out and make a big purchase. Now, if you've ever seen um, ancient Chinese money, it had holes in the center, square holes in the center of them. And that was done so that you could string your money and certain lengths of um, coins. People knew how um, how much how many coins those were all right so you didn't have to be counting the coins all the time you had these lengths of coins now those lengths of coins get cumbersome very heavy to carry and so what they did was <clears throat> they wrote a note that says you know i have so many coins at and um i'll give you that piece of paper and you bring that piece of paper to my house and I'll give you the coins. But who wanted to carry around all those coins? Everybody, you know, the weight, the cumbersome, the nature of the, just having all those coins was not good. So what happened was um, people just started exchanging the pieces of paper. If I owed Mark money, I could give him this little receipt that says, Mark, come to my house any day you want and I'll give you these coins. Well, Mark didn't really want the coins. He just wanted that value. And as long as someone, say, I don't know, um, Joseph had a store, Marco Joseph money, as long as Joseph was willing to take that receipt that said he could come to my house and pick up the coins, he was he could take that piece of paper too. And so paper money became, became as deposit receipts. Um, fast forward to 1640 in England, we see uh, the English King Charles I uh, desperately wanted uh, money. Uh, he was going bankrupt. Uh, and so he went to the gold merchants and he took all their gold and he gave them receipts that said the, the British government will pay them for their gold. And so, of course, the British government never paid, but there was always that promise to repay. Um, and so the same thing. You know, these receipts got exchanged over and over and over again. In the United States, or what was to become the United States, uh, in 1690, the English government wanted um, soldiers to go and uh, sack Quebec. They were trying to hire soldiers to go fight and uh, invade Quebec. Well, the problem was the English government had run out of money. And so they issued these pieces of paper to soldiers in Massachusetts. And that was their pay to get them to go and attack Quebec. All right. So we see paper money entering very early here. All right. So now we have to, in our next lecture, look at how 
what money is and how we measure it. 